Hi guys, in today's video we're going to take a look at vibration and infrared radiation, looking at how this influences global warming, making an infrared spectrum, the applications of infrared spectroscopy, the fingerprint region of our spectra, an exam style question, and finally a summary. So what's the relationship between vibration and infrared radiation? Well, a pair of atoms that are bonded together constantly vibrate, and infrared radiation can be absorbed by these molecules, causing them to vibrate more. This infrared radiation causes their covalent bonds to vibrate, and these bonds can either stretch, as was shown here, or bend, as was shown here. The bonds vibrate at their own frequency, usually between 300 and 4,000 reciprocal centimetres. This is in the IR region of the electromagnetic spectrum, this region over here. Now the degree of variation depends on a number of factors. These include bond strength, where stronger bonds vibrate at a higher frequency, bond length and the mass of the atoms involved in the compound or molecule, where heavier atoms vibrate at a lower frequency. Now interestingly, vibration and infrared radiation are involved in global warming. The bonds present in greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, methane and water vapour all absorb infrared radiation well. Carbon dioxide is one of the most significant man-made greenhouse gases, whilst water vapour is one of the most significant naturally occurring greenhouse gases. Now these gases absorb infrared radiation that's given off by the Earth's surface. This heat would otherwise be lost to space. So in this way you can see how our greenhouse gases play an important role in keeping the Earth warm, allowing the Earth to sustain life as it does. However, the increasing levels of greenhouse gases contribute to the increasing temperature of our planet, and it may result in further global warming, increasing the temperature of the Earth further. So now I've discussed how infrared radiation can cause our bonds to vibrate. Let's take a look at how we can make an infrared spectrum. So in order to make our infrared spectrum, we pass a beam of infrared radiation through our sample. The beam will have a frequency in the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum, and the molecules in our sample will absorb some of the frequencies. Some will pass through, and the beam that passes through and is not absorbed is analysed and we can plot a graph of transmittance against frequency. And this is the infrared spectrum of our molecule, as you can see in example given here. This is the infrared spectrum of ethanol. Now we can analyse the spectra that are formed. The peaks in our spectrum represent the vibration caused by the absorbance of infrared radiation by specific bonds in the molecule. So each of these peaks that you'll see in this spectrum here relate to a specific bond in our molecule and we can use data to tell us which bonds we're looking at. Here we have an example of some of the data you might expect to use. You'll find this data in your data booklet and it's important you familiarise yourself with your data booklet before you go into your examination so you know where everything is and how to use it. Here we're told which bond causes the peaks, here we're told the wave number of the peaks and here we're told the functional group in which these bonds lie. Here we're given a description of the peaks. So for example, the peak caused by the double bond between a carbon and an oxygen in a carboxylic acid will be between 1700 and 1725 and will be a sharp peak. Above we were given the infrared spectrum of ethanol. Ethanol we know is an alcohol and we'd expect to see a broad peak between 3200 and 3750 caused by the bond between the oxygen and hydrogen in the alcohol functional group. This is our OH absorption peak and if we take a look at our spectrum we can identify that peak over here. So now we've taken a look at how we can form these spectra. Let's compare two slightly different spectra. We take a look at the IR spectra of ethanol and ethanoic acid. Ethanoic acid has a formula of CH3COOH whereas ethanol has a formula of CH3CH2OH. If we look at the two spectra, they differ in their shape and the peaks that we see. If we take a look at the spectra for ethanoic acid, in our carboxylic acids, we would expect a peak 
between 1700 and 1725. This is likely to be a sharp peak and it's caused by the double bond between our carbon and oxygen atoms. Taking a look at our spectra, we can identify this peak over here. In our carboxylic acids, we'd also expect a peak between 2500 and 3300, a very broad peak. If we take a look at our spectra, again we can identify that peak over here. If we now take a look at the spectra for ethanol. Ethanol is an alcohol, and in our alcohol we'd expect a peak between 3200 and 3750. This will be a broad, and again if we have a look at our spectra we can identify that broad peak over here. So by looking at our infrared spectra, you can see how we can use the information to provide us with important details about the structures of our compounds. So now I've taken a look at IR spectra and how we produce them. Let's take a look at the applications of IR spectroscopy. IR spectroscopy can be used to identify the hydroxyl functional group indicative of alcohols in breathalyzers. The level of absorption that's observed on the spectrum is related to the concentration of alcohol in the blood. And in England and Wales, we'll see that the upper limit for this is 80 milligrams of alcohol per 100 mils of blood. Now, the more sensitive methods of testing are used in addition to ensure that tests are specific, as other chemicals can produce a similar spectra and may be confused. IR spectroscopy is also used to monitor air quality. It can be used to monitor levels of pollutants such as carbon monoxide and nitrogen monoxide. IR spectroscopy is also hugely useful in forensics. It can be used to identify chemicals that are present at crime scenes. These chemicals include fuels, accelerants and plastics. And in this way, IR spectroscopy can be hugely useful to identify the specific compounds and chemicals present. So now we've taken a look at IR spectra, let's take a look at a specific region of our spectra. This is the fingerprint region. It's a specific region of our spectra, and absorptions within this range are rather interesting. Not only are they caused mainly from bending rather than stretching, but taken together, they're quite unique to the specific molecule. This is why they're called the fingerprint region, and the region can be used to identify the specific chemical. Using the data from the IR spectrum given below, which functional groups does a sample contain? Now we're given the IR spectrum for a completely unknown compound, but we can have a look at the absorption peaks given to identify the functional groups present. So, firstly, we have a broad absorption peak over here, between about 2,500 and 3,500 centimetres to the minus one. Looking at our table of values, this is likely due to the hydroxyl functional group in our carboxylic acid. So let's go ahead and make a note of that. The other absorption peak we have is this sharp peak here at about 1,700 centimeters to the minus one. Again, looking at our table of values, this is likely due to the carbonyl group of a carboxylic acid. So we can make a note of that if we write our answer out in full. So now I've identified these two groups which indicate that our compound is a carboxylic acid. Let's go ahead and write our answer out in full. I've gone ahead and explained that the peak between 2500 and 3300 centimetres to minus one is from the OH bond in a carboxylic acid. And the peak between 1640 and 1750 centimetres to minus from is from the carbonyl group in a carboxylic acid. Therefore, the compound contains a carboxylic acid. So, this question holds two marks. Where do the two marks come from? The first mark comes from explaining the peaks that you've looked at and the bonds that cause these peaks. The second mark comes from identifying the functional group present, in this case a carboxylic acid. So let's move on to question two. Upon heating with acidified potassium dichromate, a sample of a branch chain alcohol A with a molecular formula C5H12O produces an organic compound B that produces the following spectrum. And we're given an IR spectrum here. Using the spectrum, determine the structure of A and B. So this spectrum represents B, the product formed by the oxidation of our branch chain alcohol. So let's take a look at some of the absorption peaks that we see in the IR spectrum of B to decide its structure. We see this sharp peak here around 1,720. So if we take a look at our table of values, we can see this is indicative of a carbonyl group. So let's go ahead and note that on. So now we know that our compound contains a carbonyl group. 
We need to distinguish between whether, whether our compound B is a carboxylic acid or a ketone. If it were a carboxylic acid, we'd expect to see a broad absorption peak that's typical of our carboxylic acids, caused by the OH bond, around 2,500 to 3,300 centimetres to minus 1. We do not have this absorption peak, and therefore B is a ketone. So let's go ahead and write down what we know already. We know that the peak around 1720 is likely due to our carbonyl group and there is no peak between 2,500 and 3,300 centimetres to the minus 1 to indicate the OH of a carboxylic acid. Therefore, B must be a ketone. And as a result, A is a secondary alcohol. Now we know that A is a secondary alcohol and B is a ketone, we can go ahead and draw a structure for both A and B. We know A is a branched chain alcohol, has a molecular formula of C5H12O, and it's a secondary alcohol. So it can suggest a suitable structure to fulfill all these criteria. Here I suggest a formula which does indeed fulfill the criteria. We have a secondary alcohol with a molecular formula of C5H12O, and it is indeed branched. So now we need to look at the structure for B. B is our ketone, produced from our secondary alcohol A. So let's suggest an appropriate structure for B. And here I've suggested the appropriate formula for a ketone formed from our branched alcohol A. So this question holds four marks. Where do our four marks come from? The first comes from discussing the absorption peaks seen in the spectra to identify that we have a carbonyl group, but we do not have a carboxylic acid. The second comes from identifying that B is a ketone and therefore A is a secondary alcohol. And the third for our correct structure of A and the fourth for a correct structure of B. The mark scheme has some leniency and if you were able to deduce a structure for B without giving one for A, you received one mark. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level chemistry resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap provide smiley face and together let's make A-level chemistry a walk in the park.